thanks. Um, I think not everybody is here yet. We said 145. Yeah, I need the, the more bodies that are closer to me. If anybody isn't scared, you can even move around closer. Disrupt the space. I, I want to move you, literally. <laughs> and emotionally. Okay, well, before, I want to uh, start by expressing my appreciation for particularly Lindsay's persistence in overcoming <laughs> the many obstacles to my being here. And I want to thank those, the other people, Deborah and Ruth, for the work they've done to make this possible. Um, I believe in education, especially the kinds of education that value non-academic forms of learning. So I tweak the, re the I tweak, tweak this presentation a little bit based on what we were talking about today, and I just thought I'd share a little genealogy of different rep ways in which um, trans has been <coughs> and gender queer has been represented. Gender Knots was a film by Monica Choi. It was my first introduction to transgender, transmasculine. Um, culture in San Francisco pr in particular. Um, I'm, well, you'll hear where I'm from and all about me soon enough. Um, but I, I became involved with, very involved with three of the people that were in this film. And it was also the very, very first time I had seen intersex, um, an intersex story depicted in film. An intersex story I'd heard anywhere. And it set in motion, a whole chain of events for me. It was also, um, yeah, the beginning of my questioning, and I guess that was in 1994 at that point. Um, I was also in a documentary. How many people, did anybody here even know of Gender Knots? You've seen uh, Venus Boys? Anybody else? Okay. I was involved with that. Much too long and I'm at the end, but what can you do? Um, heart of the Matter, More Sexes, Please, was something, um, what's her name, Heart of the Matter? Joan Bakewell, mm -hmm. right? She, I was involved with Stephen in that. Um, more recently, did anyone see me on Embarrassing Bodies? living with intersex. Well, that was also, and I, what I want to talk about a lot, especially for me, living with intersex and sex in the city, my, my agreement to have my work or myself or my story represented in the mainstream culture has, has not been binary. It's not been black and white. There's shades of gray. It has been both good as in sex in the city. Many people saw drag kings predict you know, and this was in the, I guess, 19, 2000 that this came out. It gave me validity in the eyes of the people who saw programs like Sex in the City as important. Um, it also was completely reifying heteronormativity and very problematic. And I, if, if anybody wants to do a discourse analysis um, about <laughs> gender and popular culture, I say look that up on Sex in the City. Okay, but that's... I just wanted to say that all of these forms of representation, and especially representations of trans and gender queer that go into the mainstream media, are extremely important because of the effect they have on real people. So, um, I'm going to share some of my corpus, and in my website, which is just shockingly seven years old, I have accessed technologies of gender in order to amplify rather than erase the hermaphroditic traces of my body. Um, I call myself an intentional mutation rather than simply intersex as a way of distinguishing my own journey, which has enjoyed the privilege <coughs> of choice from the majority of intersex people who have been robbed of these choices by a medical establishment that privileges normality and gender conformity above all values. Um, so that's where it's come from, and I, I call this presentation Trans Inter, what did I call it? 
<laughs> and what's on your paper. But that's because what I'm also hoping to do is show you very much the intersections um, where it's not as if trans and intersex are completely two different entities, but there's problematics in the politics, as we know, in, with representation, appropriation, etc. So it has been a privilege and my pleasure to represent bodies, both embodied bodies and ephemeral bodies that queer, as in disrupt, disturb, and delight the hollowed and hegemonic cultures we call art and academia. As you will notice, I start by utilizing the body that is most accessible to me, my own. And through the gravitational laws of attraction, um, pull other bodies away from apathy towards action with me. As John Lewis, the African-American civil rights leader, so eloquently put it, find a way to get in the way. And I do. With every molecule of my being, from my hairy hermaphroditic breast to my Barbie doll feet. On the morning tube, they're all looking at me. None of them are quite sure what it is they see. A sissy wearing makeup, tranny, dyke, puff. What they're praying for is an ultimate truth. They look me up and down because they're searching for clues. They've got no idea which pronoun to choose. But I do not identify as female or male. Those concepts don't apply to my intersex tale. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, fire breathing candy, organic, volcanic, kaboom, boom. <laughs> and yeah, I'm loud. I like a crowd. These are all facts of which I am proud. So am I undoing gender? Or is gender doing me? I'm still wondering what it is I can be. I was conceived in Kansas City, but born in California in Year of the Fire Rooster. That's also known as Year of the Cock, and that's true too. I have been known to like a bit of cock-a-doodle-doo. I come from a long line of waitresses and Avon ladies, a sidestep away from what some call poor white trash and what I call the working, working class. I call myself off-white in order to give whiteness a hue and show exactly where it's placed on the color wheel of fortune. I call myself off-white in order to honor my black Irish, Native American, and African great-grandmothers. But I was always a um, spunky girl. The first time the cops brought me home, I was five years old. Picked up with my best friend Leah Lathry selling red rocks from Mars to the local population. <laughs> we were trying to finance our intergalactic deep space mission. We were trying to go home. I persuaded the cops to let us keep the money. At 10, I staged a protest in front of the Santa Maria Times, our local paper, because they refused to hire me, who they said was a girl, to be a newspaper boy because, of course, in 1967, you needed a penis to deliver the newspapers. <laughs> At 11, I wrote a letter inquiring about becoming a Rhodes Scholar and was told that women were not eligible, but keep on getting those A's and B's. See, where does it say it? Keep on getting those A's and B's. At 17, I was arrested for public obscenity at a nude beach in Santa Barbara. My crime? When the beach got busted, I refused to put my top back on unless they made every man and boy on the beach do exactly the same thing. In court, I gave an impassioned speech, which they found amusing, and fined me half the usual penalty. Needless to say, it was a fine I would never pay. <laughs> I was certain that I was right and they were wrong. I understood from a young age that the world is a hostile place, especially for those 
of us assigned female at birth. And it was up to me to say so. Silence has never been an option I've been able to exercise. By the way, all of these pictures are me in past lives. So this is another um, polemic. Bodies that queer. So making work about the queer body is my kind of mission impossible. I should really know better than to talk about such a thing as the queer body, as if it actually exists, even if the body belongs to me. But before we go any further, a little codicil. Um, queer, what is it? Um, I don't really have to explain it to this audience, but I usually say, for me, queer is about constantly questioning all norms, including queer ones. And queer is not really a noun, that is to say, queer is not a person, nor a place, though it may be a thing. For me, queer is a verb in drag, passing as an adjective. <laughs> the queer body is a body that is always in transition, transmogrification, not conversion, according to Professor J. Prosser. A monstrous and sublime mutation, according to me. Queer bodies are bodies that don't matter, bodies that are disposable and often disowned, bodies that are not valued or valuable, bodies that through the simple act of existence come to personify resistance. <coughs> if bodies are sites of resistance, if sites of anything, then queer bodies are sites where the resistance is most fertile. Queer bodies are vulgar bodies, plebeian bodies, street bodies. Bodies that do not know the meaning of discipline. Bodies that reject the adage, one can never be too rich or too thin. Queer bodies create the template for cultural disgust and teach us what we must not want to be or to have. Queer bodies are bodies that refuse regulation and resist commodification and at the same time create spectacles of ourselves. Queer bodies are bodies that are not pampered nor pilotic, bodies that seldom swim in public and feel forced to choose passing over personal comfort. Bodies that are confined to spaces where access is available. And access needs to mean so much more than just a ramp and a handicapped toilet. Clothed I am a man, naked I am a question, says Laszlo Perlman, a performance artist who employs his own naked, hyper-masculine trans body as an antidote to the obligatory gender dysphoria so many trans people are required to perform if they want to access the technologies of gender that might make their lives more livable. Consider racialized bodies. Consider Castor Semenya, the South African runner, runner, with a body that had a white woman possessed it would have been celebrated rather than offered as a sacrifice on the altar of normalcy. Consider disabled bodies. Consider Bob Flanagan, supermasochist. His body refused to renounce pleasure or apologize or behave as a sick person should. A body with orifices that leaked with holes that demanded to be filled, with wounds that opened and would not close, reminding us so painfully of our own. Consider intersex bodies. Consider my body, a body that has chosen to amplify rather than erase its intersexiness, a body that is unwilling and unable to conform to claustrophobic cultural definitions of female or male, a body that puts itself on the line to be judged by you. <coughs> Consider the facts. A social medical industrial complex continues to have the power to regulate and reform our intersex bodies, to cut away our ability to experience genital pleasure or to reproduce ourselves in all our ambiguous glory. So what does the queer body do? It performs abjection with the kind of power only those who are despised can acquire. It shows us how to love all that we are taught to hate. And through this act of repudiation, this act of affirmation, the queer body screams, 
Look at me and love me, if you dare. Bodies that queer are bodies we fear, to have and to hold. To watch become old. As we wrinkle and flake, we must not forsake. Bodies that queer are bodies that break. But break though we might, queer bodies are strong. Like everyone else, we want to belong. But belong to what? I hear your brain scream. What kind of queer fits into a scheme? Bodies that queer are defiantly strange, which is not to say that we're never the same. Bodies, queer bodies are bodies that cannot belong to families that hate us or just make us feel wrong. No matter how much we're told to have pride, we must not be reduced or commodified. Queer bodies are bodies that refuse to restrain or retrain our pleasures our history, our pain. Herm bodies are measured, prodded and poked, were cut up and sold as a cultural joke. We're told we're disorders that need to be fixed, that doctors will cure us so we're no longer mixed. Queer bodies disturb, this cannot be denied. Our queerness is sexy and unspecified. Bodies that queer are a fetishist dream. Many of us here are a part of that team. Drag kings and drag queens, night walkers and knaves, extremely camp followers, jolly sex slaves. Queer bodies are hot. We will always exist. Why not give up attempts to resist? Queer bodies are bodies that queer. We do it in spite of, because of, our fear. Queer bodies, our bodies, we must not forsake. Queer bodies, our bodies, are the bodies we make. Resistance is fertile. Bi biology is not destiny. Deliver us from Gaga. <laughs> I believe in crossing the line, not just once, but as many times as it takes to build a bridge we can all cross together. So I'm going to just briefly go through some of the work I've done on queer representation um, and then talk about interventions, um, real life, real time interventions into um, this world we live in. So Love Bites, as, as Lindsay said, caused a bit of a furore if you, you know, sold in cellophane wrappers, you had to buy it and then, you know, lots of, really sold a lot of copies. A lot of straight men bought it. They were very <laughs> disappointed when they got home and opened it. Um, but it was very interesting how this controversy and how being censored put me on the map. Um, first published pictures, this was actually the woman I had my first orgasm with. I became a lesbian in this relationship, um, having been bi rampantly and politically bisexual from 16 to 21. First orgasm with a woman, I'm a dyke. <laughs> um, at the time, this, these were extremely um, controversial images. And you can see how tame they are by today's standards, right? Um, this was more the representation of lesbians that was allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I must, I lost my, okay, I'll just have to wing it. I made new notes and they're not on my notes here. Um, the Drag King book, what I, what I think is interesting about this is that it took me over 10 years to recognize um, the signifiers in this image and it seemed the obvious cover photo. Um, obvious because I'm white and because this is emblematic of, you know, white Western masculinity. I hate guns. 
I thought it was a stick. I didn't even know it was a gun for, for 10 years. And I'm like, wow, I put that on the cover. Um, so it's interesting to be able to look back and to think about why one made the choices one made. Um, but I'm, I'm blaming Jack, too. <laughs> My personality, um, my persona, Tess Tickle, you know, it's like my lover at the time. You may ask why I live in Sweden now, and um, this was one of the first reasons why Luigi Cabron de la Concha was very, very homophobic drag king, and so would only, I could only relate to Luigi by have performing as a female personality. So Tess Tickle was born. Okay, this is where I talked about the representation. I didn't, I, my, they were saved. Okay, so we've gone through that. Um, this is Moby Dick and Villain, and it's also, you know, again, the culture of narcissism, of repetition, of performing masculinity, those kinds of um, signifiers are all part of what is embedded in the kind of aesthetics of my work over the years. This picture was not published in the Drag King book. So I did a series with, with my partner Luigi uh, slash Indra. Um, we did a, a lot of workshops around, um, the, around Sweden and also in different countries in Europe. Um, one of the things that was, that was part of this series was also the notion of the box, as you can see here. Um, Kings to, this is Kings to Berry, which was a older drag king troupe in France who actually made their own music at the time. And I like these pictures especially because it, if you are familiar with a Roses, a Roses, a Rose gender performance in photography, um, Jennifer Blessing says, it's not possible to escape the box, but it is possible to disrupt it in pleasurable ways. Um, which is what I attempt to do. Because if you think about it, this idea, especially young um, queers today, they're like, I don't want to be put in a box. I, I, I don't want to be confined. And I'm like, well, let's look around us. Just take a minute. Look, what are we all in now? What are we sitting at? A box is not, is not something, you know, a box keeps us warm. A box drives us to and from wherever we're going. I, you know, there's a lot of things a box gives us a place to feel safe. Another box. Sublime Mutations, um, which is the monograph that I'm most pleased with because it's 10 years, it's not singular subject. Um, I'm only showing a few. This was, um, it was interesting, somebody did their PhD on Sublime Mutations and they sent me this and they were like so certain that all of these were digitally manipulated and when in fact none of them were digitally manipulated. Even as far back as Love Bites, everything they couldn't believe. So this kind of rupture in the meaning of the real was very interesting to me, how it plays out again and again in my work. Um, this is a couple that are, are still my best friends, still together, not 40 minutes from here. Um, Harry and Simon, and very interesting um, stories they have, but we have no time to get into that. So um, I'll go on to G.I. Johnny, uh, well-known butch, um, lesbian and drag king in the 90s in Berlin. Um, Johnny had what I would call a transnatural masculinity, um, and I put this in inverted commas because I know what it does, actually, is if to imply other forms of mascul trans masculinities are not natural, which is not what I'm saying, but at the time I used that term to be able to distinguish because for some people who are part of a transnational, trans masculine spectrum, it was very important that they not be, um, they, they wanted to claim the, sp the space of the butch rather than the space of trans. Um, but there were also a lot of people I've worked with, mostly because I find them extremely attractive. Um, and they're either people I'd like to sleep with or people I have slept with. 
Um, not that I'm, okay, don't get the wrong idea. People do not have to sleep with me to be in, I'm not that kind of photographer. Um, seriously, most people have not slept with me. Um, just, okay. Um, there were also people like David who I photographed when he was only 21. This is two weeks into his transition. Um, and at the time, David was very much a trans activist. After a couple of years and a state-of-the-art phalloplasty, um, he said, I'm living my life as a gay man. Man, I'm post-trans, I'm just a man. And thus, I don't know where he is now. Okay, moving on to <clears throat> um, my second full throttle collaboration with um, an academic, Ulrika Da, a queer feminist um, gender theorist from Sweden. And here I've, I've just taken a few of the mostly trans images of trans women from Femmes of Power. Um, there's a lot to say, a lot to say, but I can't go through it all. Um, Andy Candy. <clears throat> is <coughs> infections gotten, gotten means sick street, okay, infection street. And this is taken <coughs> in the hospital where Andy, who's doing a master's in gender studies in Stockholm, was trying to make um, interventions into the kind of, the, what they call the gender investigation in Sweden, where it required a trans woman to perform femininity in ways that were considered um, unacceptable for a cis woman. Um, so Andy was basically challenging them and consequently having her treatment um, stopped again and again. Shauna Virago is a trans um, rock star, trans activist in San Francisco the founder of the Transgender Film Festival in um, San Francisco, along with the late Christopher Lee. Um, she talks about, one of the things she says is, she critiques the un unreflected appropriation of the term transition that some femmes use. As she rightly pointed out, there are significant differences be between having to go through a massive psychological and medical evaluation, hormone surgery, change of social security numbers, and so on, to come into a femme identity, if you were assigned, then if you were assigned female at birth. Um, okay. I include this image of Valerie Mason John, um, because it's also interesting that how few images of queer femmes of color there are, the way in which femininity, the way in which, um, People of African descent are coded, females of African descent are coded as masculine. So um, Queenie has always been out there and been persistent in her desire to highlight, highlight the performative nature of femness. Um, this is Alex, the picture I was talking about. Charlotte is what is called a, she considers herself a perfectly um, bourgeois, middle-class, white, Swedish woman. Um, she called herself, in terms of power, the beard-adorned woman. And her gender investigation was stopped. Um, in spite of her bringing photographs of mine, of femmes who had beards, and women with beards, um, they could not, the gatekeepers could not conceive of a trans woman who wanted to keep her beard. Not all right. Um, luckily, um, in 2011, she was able to complete her journey. She got the okay. So things have changed a bit. Um, Josephine and Sophia, some people may know Josephine here. Josephine Wilson from Performers. Um, they're lesbian parents of a one and a half year old, Miranda. Um, Josephine has immigrated to Sweden, like I have, and she's also someone who doesn't take hormones or have surgery, thus she's able to produce her own sperm. So they had to go to a clinic in Sweden because of her partner's issues in order to have fertility treatment. This took about a year longer than it would for other people um, because they really didn't know what to do with 
Josephine as being legally female but having sperm. So one of the things I talk about, not so much in this talk, but is about gender queer and trans parenting um, that I believe are resistant to replicating heterosexual models. And if we have time, I'd love to talk about radical, the radical queer potential of reproductive technologies and vice versa. Um, this is an Im image of queer feminist methodology, participant, observer, um, in action. That's Ulrika Dahl with Kate Bornstein and Barbara Corellis working in the field. And I just wanted to, to talk to, uh, talking about how things tra translate. Um, Femmes of Power is working on being translated thanks to Michela there in Italian which is going to be very interesting, okay? I'm skipping out sex works simply because I don't like the um, graphic design of it. Um, are we here? Yes. So these are images that are random in different books, but worth talking about. And I thought it was also interesting what you said about um, the ways in which um, trans men being pregnant are portrayed in the media. So that's something that is also... Um, I think, cool to talk about. Um, Matt Rice is actually the first pregnant um, man that I know a full 11 years before Thomas Beattie. Um, he was thoroughly um, castigated by the trans community and more for being pregnant man, for letting the side down, for confusing things. I mean, in, what was it, 12 years, 13 years ago, the trans community was not where it is. It was much less accepting of different forms of trans masculinity than it is today. Gender queer, you know, transgender was like the, oh, uh, you know, what would you call it? The ugly stepbrother of transsexual realness. Um, in terms of realness, just a quick story. When this image was shown at one of the first, uh, what is it called? Um, das Achtfeld, the Eighth Square, in Cologne, Germany, which was one of the biggest LGBTIQ exhibitions in um, a museum in Cologne <clears throat> some years ago. Um, I was there about to do a gallery tour with, with Jack Halberstam, and I'm seeing my work for the first time, and I'm seeing this white man pointing out to the pictures, others you'll see and saying, yes, well, obviously, this is a trans woman, notice the curtness of her breast, and of course, <laughs> this, is, this is a trans male, and so on to others. So he was explaining to his two female companions in German, and you have to understand, I know almost no German, um, what, but I knew what he was saying. And there was a lot of other people. I later found out there were people for whom this man could give the thumbs up or the thumbs down to in terms of whether people or not got access to, to surgery or hormones. They were also hovering around listening to what he was going to say and what I was going to say. So I said, um, excuse me, could you repeat that in English? I'm not quite sure what you said. I'm very interested. <laughs> and he's like, yes. And so he repeats exactly what I thought he was saying. And I'm like, well, you know, that's interesting because um, you're so wrong. <laughs> I said, and I'm not going to even try to point out where you're wrong, but I'm the artist. I know these people, and you're full of shit. <laughs> and you know how good that felt? <laughs> so it's also, you know, bodies and how our identity is kind of constructed around this idea of bodies. And like myself, Laszlo, myself, lots of others now are using our bodies as a repudiation of the shame that we are supposed to cloak ourselves in. This was the other picture that was next to the other where he was saying, and of course this is Vincent Vincent who is female to unknown, and Kyle who is F to M. So he was also because, you know, talking about this idea of ultimate truth, the body as being some kind of repository for real truth.
and Moises Martinez um, doing a similar thing quite much earlier in Spain. And being, you know, in Spain, I would say it is still um, not quite as much as it was, but it's still very much around, you know, one must never show one's body, m one must be gender dysphoric, w one must be a real man. Um, this is a, a more local image. Um, uh, sorry about the date there. I think it's 2008. Um, and this was part of a workshop I did with Maji Sola Adebayo, a crisscross dressing workshop, um, where we, it was actual National Hand Holding Day here. And there was a whole, another picture which I'm not showing, has a lot of people coming because they were, they had a lot of queer envy. They were tired of their boring heterosexual normative <laughs> life and they wanted a little of our glamour to rub off on them. Um, but I really like this image in terms of how um, Al is a trans-masculine police officer and also being very genderqueer at this point. I don't know what Al's thing is right now. But interesting that this child, who I was reading as a boy, um, wanted also to be associated with that. You might be familiar with this quote, but I think it's worth repeating. Biological and psychological, biological, psychological, and social differences do not lead to our seeing two genders. Our seeing of two genders leads to the discovery of biological, psychological, and social differences. Kessler and McKenna. So, <clears throat> this was not a photograph I took of myself, but the, the kind of specter of the half and half, which was coming from the freak shows um, of, of lore, where most people were not actually intersex, but grifters, people who were fake, because the people who were fake intersex or fake hermaphrodites put on a much better show than people. Anyway, that's a whole other lecture about the circus freak show. Um, but basically, I'm sure you're all familiar here with what intersex is, right? It's like I don't have to start intersex 101 here. Um, <clears throat> but just basically in terms of how we're represented throughout antiquity as, as a kind of visual pleasure in the case of the sleeping hermaphrodite. Remember, there was no television, no radio, no internet. This is what took the place, sculpture and art. And so the surprise that was um, enacted when people saw this, it was, it was a more high status view. Um, you'll also remember that Herculean Barben, uh, the memoirs of a hermaphrodite that Michel Foucault um, published charts the history of the immense struggles to discover the truth of the sex body and what sex can, should, or must mean. Um, okay, representation, positive versus negative. As we all know, in Boys Don't Cry, one of the most, the first popular representation of female to male transsexuals, Brown and Tina became a hero. Why? Because he died and everything could be projected onto Brown and Tina. Um, similarly, it was interesting to me at the time, the memoirs of the, Sarah Lever discovered she was um, intersex through the creation, creating this one woman show of hers, um, which was very interesting, but she, you know, she also died. At the same time, um, there was a, a, I went at the drill hall, there was a, a reading of a play, and the name escapes me right now, in which I found out accidentally that I had inspired because I spoke back to the surgeons in 1999 at an intersex co conference at this Tavistock Center. But in the, the theatrical reenactment of the specimen, that's what it's called, the specimen, the specimen dies. And I'm like, why do we always have to die? That's my own um, half and half creation. Um, I could go into a lot of examples of intersex in sport and the history of how um, science and culture have tried to locate the truth. Is it in the chromosomes? Is it in the 
um, hormones? Is it in the anatomy? And this is all very well played out within the Olympics. Um, what is most interesting about this example is here, Erika Schneeger, who is an Austrian Alpine downhill racing champion, was disqualified at the Olympics. She then went on to transition and become Eric. Um, there is a autobiography called My Victory Over Myself, The Man Who Became a Female World Champion. Um, and she now runs a successful skiing school in Austria. Um, there's a lot of other examples I could give you where non-white Olympic champions who have been disqualified for being female have attempted suicide, have not had nearly as successful outcomes. Um, Castor Semenya, you might have seen the documentary by Max Jinan, uh, Too Fast to Be a Woman. Castor is one of also the people who is saying, I'm not going to be a poster child for the intersex movement. I'm not telling you whether I am or I'm not intersex. It's not important to me whether or not Castor is intersex. What's important to me is the way in which intersex was represented in the media. Um, okay, spoiler alert, there's a couple genital pictures coming up. You might have already seen some. Okay, here we go. These are the drawings um, of Herculean Barben's genitals. It was, dry, it was images like this and the one I'm going to show you next that inspired some of the work I've done on genitals and the body and what I call transgenital landscapes. So um, when I saw drawings like this, when I saw photographs like this, Again, um, Herculean Barben created the perfect spectacle of the hermaphrodite because he, she could be drawn and examined and dissected after death and left memoirs. Um, so I saw many images like this. I saw many more images like this from the French photographer Nadar from 1868 where you have the important aspect of this picture is the hand of the surgeon. Um, this is replicated over and over and over again in medical photographs that reduce the person to an object, to an orifice, or a small protrusion. Um, this <clears throat> is more double, but I'll just read um, the introduction to Sublime Mutations. Jay Prosser writes, transgenital landscape which is the flip side of F to M, captures the real difference of the transsexual body. In Volcano's photographs, we arrive at a split in the meaning of the real, for it is the passing of transsexuals as real men that obscures the material difference of their bodies and their differently gendered history as transsexuals. Exposing this body as transsexual threatens to undo the masculine realness that their gender passing has secured. <coughs> Does that make sense? I have to read it a lot before I got it myself, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's also in conversation with Maplethorpe um, in terms of like um, the stereotype of the large, you know, is it two inches or two feet, the black phallus? and white male anxiety about it never being big enough. Come on, you guys, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, I'm not a Foucauldian, even though I've referenced him a few times, but um, this, do we truly need a true sex with the persistence of borders and stubbornness? Modern Western societies have answered in the affirmative. Um, they have obstinately brought into play the question of a true sex in an order of things where one might have imagined that all that counted was the reality of the body and the intensities of its pleasures. And I might just say the intensity of its pleasure is something that many, not all, but many intersex people are robbed of when they're given genital surgery to make their bodies conform. Milton Diamond is a um, 
sexologist who was the one who exposed another sexologist, John Money, mm -hmm. in the paradigm of tabula rasa in terms of gender. Um, <clears throat> okay, as I said, my last, I think, um, identity project called Visibly Intersex because it has taken me 17 years to find intersex people who were willing to be visible, besides myself and one or two others. It was through, um, what I'm missing by being here, I just have to say, is an intersex activist forum, the third annual that's in Malta. So not only am I missing the activist part, I'm missing the Malta part. <laughs> <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> so I'm here. Um, so there's a lot of people working and who have been like um, Julius Kagwa in Uganda. And all of the, not all of them, but most of these people are also considering themselves both intersex. We have intersex physiologies, anatomies. Um, not all of us have intersex identities, which is something we can talk about. But all of us have rejected the assignment we were given at birth. So, and, and many of us have employed the same technologies of gender as trans people in order to achieve that. Ince um, is also an artist and was, we're the two, um, I would say it's safe to say we're the two best known intersex artists in the world. We get, always get to have these wonderful museum exhibitions together where we're basically ignored by the mainstream but we're there. <laughs> and these are different people that are doing, you know, trans activists like Dan, who are doing amazing work. OI stands for Organization Intersex International. So as you can see, we have, we look, um, very different from each other. Hiker, it's worth noting, is, um, oh, I don't have the, there's another poster. Hiker goes all over Taiwan and China offering free hugs for intersex. Mm -hmm. and, and then saying, having a big eye and says, I was here. Um, Hiker's project is a very, very um, interactive visibility project. <coughs> So in terms of my queer feminist methodology, I, I don't actually take pictures anymore. I prefer to think of it as I make pictures together with speaking subjects. And Mauro is somebody that, um, he was in the other pictures as well, he was somebody that was also saying, you know, this kind of thing, showing the body, I'm proud, I have these scars, I'm not having this body beautiful. Um, and, you know, it's very brave to do that. I'm also trans, and it's like, to be someone who is both trans and intersex mm -hmm. is a very, very precarious position. Um, a lot of intersex people, we don't know, a lot of people will say, all, most intersex people, some intersex people say this, are normal. Meaning they are, um, have a binary identity as intersex men or women, or just men or women with an intersex experience, and they're heterosexual. And they want to distance themselves from queers and from transsexuals. So there, it's a very difficult move movement to be part of, because there's also so much transphobia and suspicion. Some I, I understand, and others I find problematic. Okay, everyday life and in inter, what I call interventions. And one of the things I do every single time, I have an American passport, which says F for freaky, fabulous female, I suppose. Um, but I go through the border control, I have to fill out a landing card, and 
I have, for 17 years, I have not put female. Sometimes I draw a, um, I just put the X with the heart around it. Sometimes if I have time, which is as often as I can, they don't notice it. I'm like, okay, all these trans people who have problems going in and out of border, why are they leaving me alone? You know, I want to educate them. Um, I have, and sometimes I've had them all gather around and I've given them a half an hour lecture on intersex and gender, queer, trans, you know, why they should, you know, I ask them, so what is your policy for people whose appearance does not met, um, meet the gender marker on the passport? What, what kind of training have you got? And they're like, uh, training? <laughs> I say, well, let me help you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this, I don't know if you saw this, that you probably don't read Diva magazine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Okay, so you see what you're missing out by not looking at lesbian culture. <laughs> um, I write for Diva after being basically kicked out of that community for many years. We, had, we got some new progressive editors. Um, so I wanted to write a piece about um, transmasculine um, reproduction technologies. This is my wedding picture in the woods very anti-consumerist, I assure you. Um, and this is part of what I do now, is um, I am open and visual. I'm in a lot of local. I live in a, a town in Sweden called Orebro, two hours west of Stockholm, 150,000 people on a good day. Um, but I get to make a lot of interventions into the local culture, which actually get, then gets picked up by the more mainstream culture. Um, I educate people in the hospitals and, you know, when they, this is our fertility clinic team. Um, our embryologist has become a good friend of mine. I'm very much a geek. I like to know all about this. I just bought Deborah's book about reproductive technologies, which I'm hoping she'll take issue with some of the things we say, so we might be able to have a really productive discussion. Um, I'm very much interested in that, and actually kind of hitting against the, the feminist discourse that, said, that kind of situates IVF and reproduction as a kind of regressive move. I'm not saying that's what you've done. I haven't read the book yet. Um, but one of the things I do, like breastfeeding, um, I breastfed our child when Mika was small um, through the use of this Medalla supplementary system. Um, and this has been shown in the media. Almost no, you know, I almost get nothing but positive comments in Sweden for this. One of the things I've done lately, and I'm just going to take the opportunity to um, read a letter I've written one of, you know, I have with Mika, I have a whole new opportunity to influence and guide impressionable young minds. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'm Mika's mapa, but a few weeks ago, this is the letter I wrote to the parents at the daycare. Um, a few weeks ago, when I went to pick Mika up from daycare, some of the other kids said to Mika, Hey, har kommer din papa Mika? Hey, here comes your papa, Mika. I could see that Mika was a bit confused because to Mika, I am Mapa, not Papa. One of the kids who called me Mika's Papa is a neighbor. So I responded in my bad Swedish that actually I was Mika's Mapa, someone who is both a mama and a papa. I don't know what the ch child understood, but I wouldn't be surprised if this information was confusing. When I told one of the staff, they were very responsive and they said sometimes, when they read stories, they switched from mama or papa to mapa. Good. Um, it's the first step. Um, but my experience has taught me that more information is a good idea. If the kids and their parents are being asked to understand something that our culture says does not exist. Most of us are raised to believe that on, there are only two sexes and two sexes only, male and female. Um, however, I'm one of the at least one in 2,000 people who have bodies that are not entirely male or female. And then I go on to explain a little bit more like that. And 
without going into too much detail. I explain about intersex variations, blah, blah, blah. And then I say, I'm an intersex activist and part of what I do as a job is to educate on this and other subjects related to human rights. I make that which has been hidden visible. I'm proud to be who I am and to do what I do. I'm not a man, even though I look and sound like one. I'm not a woman, even though I was raised as one. I'm intersex, I'm me. So in order to be true to myself and show the world that it's possible to live a fulfilled and happy life, I choose to be visible. I choose to reject the model of shame, secrecy, and silence um, that we who are intersex are told we must adopt in order to be integrated members of society. These are the reasons I'm writing to you and ask that you honor my request to be called Mika's Mapa. I also invite you to talk to me, ask questions, concerns. When kids of my own family have asked me if I'm a girl or a boy, I say something like, well, even though most people are either boys or girls, a few people like me are kind of special. We get to be both. Um, so to end, I'll just end with this image of Mika Alexis Volcano at Mika's first demonstration. Um, almost two years ago now. And I'll also end with um, Beatrice Preciado's manifesto um, for the trans feminist insurrection. I'll read a little bit from that. We are the dykes, the whores, the trans, the immigrants, the blacks, the hetero dissidents. We are the rage of feminist revolution and we want to bear our teeth. We have outgrown woman as the political subject of feminism and is in, which is in itself exclusive. It leaves out the dykes, trans wars, the ones who wear veils, the ones who are in little and don't go to the university, the ones who yell, the immigrants without legal resident paper, the fads. Let's dynamite the sex and gender binominal as a political practice. Let's follow the path we began. One is not born a woman, but becomes one. Let's continue unmasking the power structure, the division, the hierarchy. Thank you.